Welcome to another episode of Hemp Barons. Our guest on today's show has been instrumental in helping to usher in the reemergence of industrial hemp as a stable crop for our modern agricultural systems. His understanding and dedication to the plant is fostering economic development and helping agricultural communities rebuild their economies. Let's join Joy's conversation with Tom Dermody. Well, hello, Tom. Welcome to Hemp Fair, and thank you for being with us today. It's a pleasure, Joy, and thanks for having me. Well, I have known you for some years now. You are one of my favorite intellectuals and advocates in the hemp movement, United States, North America, and globally. Your command over the complexities in almost every aspect uh, of this plant, what legal, regulatory, and particularly as it relates to seed and common sense regulation is almost unmatched. So impressive. And it's always a deep honor and a great pleasure to speak with you. And you're here today, uh, and I hope you'll tell us a lot about what you're involved with, but you're here today with regards to Bija Hemp. Can you tell us a little bit about Bija Hemp and how it came to be? Absolutely. So Bija Hemp is a Colorado-based company focused exclusively on offering certified seed to the emerging industrial hemp industry. We got our start in 2015 as the first compliant importer of viable hemp planting seed into the state of Colorado, uh, which has flourished into our ability to domesticate seed production and in turn service the, the essential planting needs of row crop style hemp farmers here in the U.S., though we are fortunate uh, in the last four years we have grown into a global brand and service planting seed needs in Europe, North America, South America, and in 2020, we're beginning the process of servicing Australia as well. Beyond you know, the, the, the run of the mill planting seed, we also are very fortunate to play an active role in the development of new lines of, of industrial hemp that as we grow our company, what will enter into the market to service the demand needs specifically of the grain and fiber markets, or, or I'm trying to use the word industrial materials more than fiber, because that really conveys the, the value of that plant more, more fully. Right now, we, we service about 13 states in the U.S., and in total, about six countries worldwide. And I find it so interesting, of course, using this term interchangeably as you discuss the nuance of, of describing fiber varieties as industrial materials or industrial uses, the same could be said for the oil seed varieties if we chose not to use the word grain, because, of course, we're talking for oil seed, industrial sealants and coatings as an additive for very many industrial purposes. And while, of course, we don't want to use the valuable uh, hemp seed for fuel, we would much prefer to use uh, the methane resources or ethanol resources that that valuable plant can give us. We certainly could make biodiesel and have made biodiesel when people are making it now out of that out of that seed. So it's interesting as we move forward. Are we going to say oil seed and fiber? Are we going to say grain and fiber? Or are we going to say human ingestion and industrial or ingestion for animals and industrial? So interesting. But I wanted to also just back up. And, and you're such a great educator, Tom. And, and we discuss it on this show very often, this issue of genetics and seeds, because there's a lot of, of course, this consciousness of extract varieties, which are new to us in hemp, relatively new, right? In the last six years or so, uh, we, we'd worked so hard as an industry, as a crop around the world to basically breed the resin and the THC, the intoxicating component of, of the cannabis plant out of these hemp varieties, these oil seed grain and, and industrial fiber varieties um, of hemp. And then in about in the last six years, we've worked very, very hard to try to breed the resin back into the plant for the non-intoxicating cannabinoids that have so many general wellness and other health benefits that we're researching right now. And that, of course, has caused a THC issue. So can you give the listeners a little lesson on why, what is the certified pedigreed seed and why it is so important 
in the emerging hemp industries. And I'm adding a third part only because you're smart enough to handle it. And why is that a challenge given our various photo periods and climates here in the United States? Oh, that's a doozy, but I can't wait to answer it. Now, certified tree, the, the way I, I like to, to break it down is the replication of a known distinguishable variety for commercial use. So you, you, you have to go out and manage the production of a given lot so that the seed that results is uniform for the grower. And this is a fundamental part of our our traditional agricultural system. The yield and resulting revenue potential of a standardized crop input is higher than that of what we traditionally refer to as heirloom varieties. It helps set standardization within a given commodity at a fundamental level. And that is entrusted uh, to uh, departments of agriculture in conjunction with the association of official, official seed certifying agencies within a given state. And those have international counterparts um, all housed with under um, ISTA, which is an international body concerning seed uh, certification and validity of a given genetic. Now, outside the United States, there are various degrees of a mandated certified seed because of the issues with THC being a little uh, promiscuous, let's say, in successive generations of hemp. Um, it, it's well documented that successive production lots will eventually lead to, um, let's say, that promiscuity with THC. And that's why it's so critical considering the regulatory environment that uh, you know, operators have to face in having access to certified seed. Now, I think that the, the challenge is, to, to your point, the experiment with commercializing CBD has taken root in the United States. But the process that we actually develop what a certified lot of seed does not have an equivalency in clonal or feminized seed propagation of industrial hemp at the moment. But the, let, let's hold that for a second because there's a bigger fundamental issue to solve when talking about certified seed, and that's owning the rights to actually multiply a given variety of seed. Uh, one of, I, I think, the most important aspects of the 2018 Farm Bill is clarifying the ability to uh, seek plant variety protection or some sort of equivalency uh, from an IP perspective. But you have to hold title to a variety and represent that before a certifying body, before you can even start the process. And, and I think um, over the, the last, you know, th there is been this notion of, of preparing for this, especially with, with comparable breeding programs. Uh, but but I also, you know, would like to take the chance to say that this is in part thanks to the work of folks who are in the certified seed business, actively participating in the trial assessment and, and production schemes that are available presently to spur the interest in, in these more novel applications. Now, what makes this all so hard, Joy, of course, is um, we're coming out of the closet, and there has never been a plant that has come off the Schedule 1 and into the, let's say, normalized commodity system. So hemp will be that, that, that first trial. And this, the, the way that breeders, geneticists, whether they're, you know, of 20 years of cannabis experience or 20 years of professional development work in the more traditional agricultural industry is them being able to produce a record that shows that that variety is stable, distinguishable, and compliant with respect to THC. Um, the Office of Plant Variety Protection is accepting um, applications at this time. Uh, I, there are, you know, probably over a, a dozen companies that have now filed. Uh, at this point, those are you know, subject to, to public records, so they're available online. It makes for, for a very interesting read in that breeders are assessing what the market is going to need in two, 
five, 10 years. And, and probably the most fundamental way of, of seeing how uh, the market is translating its needs back to these breeders is, is by way of these pending applications. And predominantly what you see is folks patenting seed because that is arguably the easiest to get into the certified class at the moment. Um, though I am very hopeful that more unique and ultimately appropriate certification methods for clonal and feminized seed will become available in the next 18 to 36 months, uh, subject to funding and USDA's uh, position on, on this as well. And it's so, as you say, while, while the PVP, Plant Variety Protection Act, um, is now just being opened up to hemp, it's true that these global certifying bodies, AOSCA that you mentioned, the Association of Official Seed Certifying Agencies, has been engaging in creating this scheme for some number of years now. I think time goes by so quickly these days, but I think it was all the way back in 2014 that they began to create those, those schemes for AOSCA. Um, and then the OECD, of course, the Organization for Economic Community Development, um, as well. And, and I think also sort of to, to just distill down very rudimentar rudimentarily um, what you said is we need agriculture runs, generally speaking, commercial agriculture runs on unique, distinct, and stable varieties of seeds. A farmer wants to get into a contract with a manufacturer for a very specific type of, of a crop, generally with the manufacturer wants to know before the seed is put into the ground that there's going to be a certain nutritional profile, let's say if it's hemp for, for grain purposes or human consumption, or um, a certain diameter of uh, stock for another purpose. And, and then to sort of compare it with another crop, there are different types of strawberries, there are different types of corn, there are different types of tomatoes. That doesn't happen by magic or haphazard happenstance, nor is a farmer or a manufacturer taking a chance that the strawberries uh, that, will, that that farmer will grow will meet the specifications of that manufacturer's or uh, seller's needs. This is what unique, distinct, stable varieties of, of seeds are for agriculture. That's how business is done. And while we do have these certified pedigreed seeds for the oil seed and fiber uh, varieties of hemp in other parts of the world that work beautifully in other parts of the world, the issue bringing them into the United States is how well the different photo periods and climates and soils and farming techniques and all of those things affect the characteristics of those plants when we grow them here um, and how will we be able to stabilize them. So. And, and for the listeners out there, once a, a seed has become unique, distinct, and stable, it needs to be maintained in a breeding program to maintain those characteristics. So we always want to go back uh, to, that, uh, to that seed when, when um, we have availability to do that. So very interesting things. And what did you think, Tom, about... The USDA's interim final rule, and of course, um, in the USDA interim final rule that was filed uh, in the Federal Register on October 31st, there was no mention of a seed certification scheme on any level. What did you think about that? And ultimately, what would you like to see for regulation in the United States with regard to certif certified seeds? For sure. And I think it's an important Note that while the IFR does not directly comment on a mandate or pre preference for status certified seed, many of those pr uh, provisions are ultimately found in place at the state level within what, what is commonly referred to as a state seed act, where there are qu uh, quality measures assigned to anyone that is selling seed or nursery products and that is really where the hard work of how to integrate uh, certified seed of any uh, commodity takes place what i think that the other piece to, to usda's credit in not mandating it is going back to the assumption that state members of aosca and or usda have recognized that there is a need to diversify certification classes meaning Row crop style, we already have that. We need to develop 
a system for clonal and feminized seed. And where that is going to take place is by way of what's called a quality tag assessment conducted at a state level for state use only. Upon the success of that quality tag measure, other state departments of agriculture can replicate that system and so on choose to implement that because frankly, what kind of certification is at, is dependent on what kind of hemp you're going to grow. And I wouldn't say that the state of North Dakota needs to focus all its efforts on producing a feminized seed certification class when that particular portion of the country is more well suited to grow it at you know broad acre row crop style industrial hemp for uh, grain and or industrial materials categories. Now that is the, the exact opposite is true of somewhere in the deep south, uh, like Florida, Georgia, for instance, South Texas, where the infrastructure to support hemp cultivation may lean more readily towards horticulture style hemp um, or, or what we commonly refer to as uh, you know, high cannabinoid containing varieties. Um, you know, presently. Now, I, you know, it, it, you know, we're very fortunate because of our involvement in the certified seed business to see that these things were coming, and, and we are, you know, very committed to the idea of certified seed and what it means. And our position has been, if and when there is a class of fem or clonal availability, we will be right there to support it because we see that is a key need of growers, and in turn the downstream supply chain because that reliability that you talked about is the only way that this industry is going to you know, stand the test of time. Many commodities have failed at working out the basics very well. Um, and, and, and frankly, I, in 2020, I think both private operators and the USDA are just trying to work out the basics before we uh, try to throw something new on there, like mandating certified seed or, or something to that effect. Uh, but again, the, the most fundamental piece and something that, that I'm frankly most excited about in 2020 is you see state departments of agriculture in conjunction with their AOSCA members coordinating the best trial systems that we've seen since the implementation of the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, some of them are a little heavy handed. Uh, for instance, the state of Missouri, Kentucky, as well as Florida have mandated that if you intend to sell seed or nursery products in these states, you shall submit that variety for formal testing so that growers have the resources to evaluate a given variety uh, in the out years 2021, et cetera. And then you, you've got something a little softer, though, something we, we've participated here in Colorado for a number of years, where it is a non-mandated testing um, that allows a given variety to enter the certified class of seeds that, you know, they're, they're Colorado is probably the most well known, but I believe uh, several other states will have a voluntary program come 2020 in anticipation of, of commercial opportunities in 2021. Now, when Washington State first legalized uh, hemp, and of course, Washington legalized adult use uh, cannabis in 2012 through an initiative of the people. The entire West Coast legalized adult use cannabis through initiatives of the people and medical as well because they have those mechanisms in place. Whereas it took another four years and I was a resident and, and was very much involved in, of course, the advocacy and, and drafting and that movement at the time to legalize hemp, which uh, didn't happen until March of 2016 in that state and uh, didn't plant its first legal hemp seed until June of 2017, long after the adult use um, market had been well established. And it was very interesting because uh, the Washington State Department of Ag was insistent that only certified seeds uh, be allowed in the state that has since changed with subsequent legislation. And many folks didn't understand, I'm getting to sort of a cultural misunderstanding slash cultural ideal around being able to have farmers save seeds and, and that, the, that this plant of all the seeds of all the plants on the whole planet earth 
this seed should be available to everyone and everyone should be able to grow it. And uh, what, what do you think Washington State's thinking was at the time and why would a Department of Ag or state wish only to have certified seeds um, in their scheme, their agricultural scheme? Uh, long-term advocate of seed choice and, and the ability to maintain heirloom varieties. Well before I got, got into hemp, I had cemented in that, but I think the really hard part of all this joy is THC. And, and uh, I'll, I'll get back to, to Washington State now. Initially, the certified seed mandate was a risk aversion tool, not so much for growers of, of hemp, but for, for marijuana interests. I mean, you've got, to your point, three years of tax revenue, job creation, and uh, ultimately the, the economic benefit that that brings to, to the communities where marijuana cultivation is legal. Then hemp which kind of looks like marijuana but you can do all these other amazing things shows up and, and that's going to have um somewhat of an uphill battle right it, it, it's a it's a complementary crop if you look at it the right way but for folks who are growing marijuana we all know the biggest thing they fear is pollen and, and i think that ingrained interest is ultimately what stifled uh and resulted in washington department of ag mandating certified seed so that they could you know, create some, some comfort. Indeed, cross-pollination was a, a major concern, a hysterical concern in legal states, and, and it still is in many states, and, and it's not that it's not a legitimate concern. In fact, originally, um, there was a nothing in the law with regard to really cross-pollination specifically. Um, the regulations came out, and uh, and there first started out to be a three-mile buffer zone between the edge of a legal hemp field and the edge of a legal marijuana field or even the edge of an indoor marijuana facility, the licensed facility. Not Because keep in mind, Washington residents who have uh, medical cards are actually allowed to grow uh, marijuana outside um, and they, if they're willing to be in a in a database, uh, they can grow a couple of more plants outside. That number was greatly reduced with the with the advent of adult use legalization. There it used to be 15 plants per medical patient. Then it was put down to four. And then if you're put in a, a database, you can grow up to six. And we certainly didn't want this cross pollination barrier hysterical concern to relate to just cardholders. We, we fought very hard for the inclusion in those regs to say of licensed marijuana facilities. So there could be some order uh, to this. And the hysteria, hysteria was so huge that even indoor marijuana facilities, because of course, Washington is one of the few states that allows for adult use and medical marijuana licensed uh, to be grown outside um, in addition to those personal plants. But the hysteria was so big that folks said, oh, we, there's not a carbon filter strong enough to prevent the dastardly hemp pollen from coming into my indoor grow facility. So, so it started out as a three-mile barrier. It was then expanded the next year to four, year, four miles from, a, from I believe, a, a senator who it represents a district that has a vast majority of, of uh, legal adult use um, cannabis constituents and she asked for that for that barrier to be increased and and frankly we were just thrilled that she wasn't saying 10 miles and only wanted it to be increased for one mile the the major problem that came besides that being a logistical nightmare of this ridiculous barrier was that the the hemp farmer was not grandfathered in the licensee of the marijuana program was was grandfathered in so let's say that you drained your retirement income uh borrowed money equity from your home maybe got a loan from your aging parents to invest in your in your dream hemp farm and you got a thousand acre farm in washington you started growing hemp investing in the emerging hemp industries and that opportunity and building that economy in washington state and then a licensed marijuana grower comes in in that four mile barrier and then the hemp farmer these were only annual licenses 
licenses in the beginning, goes to renew their license and it is denied because they're no longer eligible because their farm is within the four mile zone. Not the licensee, not the marijuana licensee who moved in and could move about the cabin anywhere they want within the state, but the hemp farmer. So it was really, really ridiculous. What are some things that you ran up against or observations around what was now temporary? It's not there anymore that legislation has changed, but what are your thoughts around that sort of crazy development as, as the revolution unfolded? I, I, I called it the weed wars and I still call it the weed wars, but it, you know, your, your second point is actually the really one that, that I, I think hits the nail on the head in terms of that ingrained interest that I was getting at. And, you know, Regulators are not generally scientists, too, and the fear of losing constituent support, that is, uh, was very clearly indicated in this preference for a marijuana cultivator as opposed to a uh, hypothetical historical hemp farmer. But the, the pollen issue is you know, somewhat cost prohibitive on behalf of the indoor grower. There certainly are means uh, to, to mitigate pollen, even though cannabis generally has one of the smallest grain sizes of any known plant in the world. Uh, that has been kind of a mute point since p- people had access to more professional uh, HVAC services or otherwise. A- a- as an aside, though, pollen is a regionally appropriate risk, meaning that Specifically, your relative humidity index is probably one of the leading uh, causes or uh, limitations on whether you will be pollinated in a given growing area. In the Mountain West, things are exceedingly dry. Pollen, like feral hemp, for instance, travels very far. And the availability of feral hemp makes it even more challenging and, and cost prohibitive to determine you know, what is the source of a the pollen intrusion, let's say, but places like the the South, where it's you know humid in the middle of February, um, it, you may have a, a very limited window of pollen viability, so your related risk is much smaller. But these are are the the nuances that people need to understand, um, and in part, kind of you know headed towards the Pacific Northwest, since that that's where we're talking about. We have shied away from doing business because we don't want a neighbor to be considered a bad neighbor because they bought seed from us. Um, and the availability and interest in CBD cultivation ha- has pushed us elsewhere uh, for the time being because we don't want to be the source of being a bad neighbor. Um, and until we have the basic agronomic research to validate what is a buffer zone, I think it is highly inappropriate for state regulators to think that they're scientists. Um, in this respect. And that's why it's so critical to see institutions like Oregon State, Colorado State University, as well as Cornell stepping up to be the agronomic juggernauts that they have been for every other plant that's ever been successful. Uh, It it gives me a lot of hope in addressing this question because when pollen comes up, um, it usually runs into a very long and, and somewhat boring conversation about how did you mitigate risk or, or how do you know this is the source, uh, so to say. And uh, from there, th- things usually get called because people are more uh, concerned about being seeded than, than the validity of where they got seeded from, which, which I can totally understand as well, because that's a tremendous amount of value. And it's wonderful that the USDA has given a half million dollar grant to, I believe, the University of Virginia to study cross-pollination. And in fact, That's what Washington very much wanted to do, set up some pollen capturing devices. It was another reason for the certified seed. They thought, how are we going to be able to contribute to this conversation, to the collection of scientific data around pollen travel with hemp if we have so many varieties growing, at least if we had just certified varieties that would help. There was, so there were sort of these additional uh, logical uh, pieces, as illogical as some of them may have been, that, that went into that thinking. And so as we wrap up here, I'd love to get some of your predictions, Tom. And, and they're based around this cross-pollination issue. And I remember I had a big event. Um, we had a, a 
screening of Bringing It Home way back in 2015 or so. Um, and I had Andrea Herman, my mentor and very, very close friend, come from Manitoba, even though, of course, she's a Missouri Joplin girl who left us for Canada in 2001 so she could be with the hemp. And we discussed, somebody in the audience asked the cross-pollination issue, and I remember Andrea saying, well, hey, maybe, maybe Washington's just not a hemp state. And I had a small heart attack and I said, oh, she didn't just say that, everybody. There's no way she just said that. And and uh, she said, well, well, Joy, you know, things might end up quite regional over A, pollination and B, of course, infrastructure and manufacturing. What do you think? Do you think that ultimately in, if we just look at the United States instead of the global perspective as the hemp economy emerges? How do you think it would settle out? And I know you're not a betting man, but if you might make a prediction no one will hold you to today, how do you think it will settle out? Will this be, will we have regions where more grain is happening and extract is happening here and industrial purposes here and marijuana here? What are your thoughts on that, Tom? I I, I couldn't agree more with, with Andrea's assessment because you, you really, two, two pieces. Um, crop diversification is ultimately one of the most critical things for us to address systemic problems uh, in our in our agro economy. But it's equally important to recognize the need for diversification in hemp because there are parts of the country that are better suited, uh, whether from an agronomic or, or marketplace standpoint, to grow certain types of, of hemp. Uh, I I, I don't necessarily know if where and how CBD is cultivated is is you know something my tea leaves tell me at the moment, but as a, a, a you know I must be a betting man I'm in the hemp industry draw I just let, let's not lose that either but places like the South where cotton has a real keen interest in, in diversifying to a new crop are more well suited to the indu- production of industrial materials by way of industrial hemp than that of trying to grow Christmas trees for for CBD. Uh, And the same is true of the Midwest, where feral hemp, thanks to its historical usage, is prevalent. Um, That meaning that it's going to be, again, harder to produce high-quality floral material where feral hemp is readily available. Uh, With that being said, I think the coasts, because of their proximity to major consumer bases, and especially crop markets, is better suited for CBD than that of the interior of the country, which I hope to see the most acreage growth to service the application of of grain and or industrial material sourced um, via industrial hemp. But my let's say my my other prediction is something that, that I don't hear too many people talk about right now. Um, hemp seed has attained grass status uh, or generally recognized as safe. That is having tremendous implications on the human consumption, animal feeds market in particular, not only in this country, but in countries around the world. Because once the U.S. deems something grass, it, it's good to go in other countries, just, just to kind of put it uh, plainly for a second. Now, the other than the the proliferation of grain applications for a second, doesn't that show that there's a precedent that a portion of the cannabis plant can attain grass status? And and my prediction is that uh, 2020 and beyond, people will be more forceful about that line of thinking uh, with respect to other parts of the plant uh, at, at present. You know, the, the discussion centers around CBD, but more novel cannabinoids cannabis source, tor- terpenes, et cetera, can use that precedent to, to get a leg up to where they haven't been able to, to kind of fit that notch, um, so to say, in the last couple of years. And then, um, kind of, you know, a bit going back to this theme over the course of the podcast, but I think uh, come 2021 and beyond, we will see this development of novel certification schemes that will reduce the risk of growers cultivating more hemp and ultimately buyers of that crop feeling more confident in their purchase. And that is really where uh, 
you know, the, the long-term value of how I think starts to kick in. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing you then, too. <laughs> Thank you for all of that, Tom. Thank you for everything that you do for the hemp movement, everything that you understand and articulate and share and contribute uh, to the hemp movement. And I can't wait to just keep working with you and, and lock in arm in arm as we move into the sunshine and really watch the unfolding of the delivering on the promise of the world's most versatile, valuable crop. Uh, you're such a bright star in this community, Tom. Thank you so much for being with us today. I enjoy it. I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you for the, the work that you've done to, to get us here. You know, it, it's always something I admire. Uh, and we're, we're finally going to see what you've been talking about for, for over 20 years in the not so distant future. <laughs> thank you so much, brother. Until the next time, and you sure will be on again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you.